Good morning. We return to our series in the book of Exodus. We discover the people of God at Mount Sinai. They've now returned to the place where Moses was sent by God to release the people from Egypt. We'll see two things in particular as we explore this passage. Firstly, that it is God who is the rescuer. God moves towards his people to save his people. Secondly, God provides a way to live in freedom, a vision of the freedom and wholeness which is rooted in an ongoing relationship and life with him. So why don't you grab your Bible and we're going to read from it, from Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to 6, and then Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 21. It says... On the first day of the month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And then chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children of the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in the land. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his male or female servant or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbour. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. It's not complicated really. At a very simple level, in these chapters, God says, I've set you free. And here's how to live in that 
freedom as I lead you towards your eternal home with me in my kingdom. As I was preparing this message, I found a particular resonance with John chapter 14. Jesus had just washed his disciples' feet in the upper room and has told them that he's going to be leaving them. They were distressed and troubled. And Jesus said to them, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. This is what the people of Israel are being invited to do as we find them at Mount Sinai. This is a significant milestone in the journey of the people of God. They've been delivered from death and slavery in Egypt, and now they are about to enter into a national covenant relationship with God. Through Moses, God reminds the people what he has done for them. We see that because of God's indescribable, indescribable, uncontainable love, for them. He rescued them out of Egypt, death and the bondage of sin, and brought them to himself. The image of being carried on eagles' wings is a powerful one. The image is of, be, uh, the image is of this being God's action towards his people, like being Uh, Like the mother bird carrying her young to safety, so God carries his people out of death and darkness to freedom. It's the image of God as protector, provider. As the one who is able to overcome all physical barriers and enemies, who soars above the elements, uh, the elemental forces of this world. It is fascinating that the word used for fear here uh, in the Hebrew is of, is, is a, has, a, has a feminine sense to it. It reinforces the image of God as the eagle who protects and provides for her young. And the fear that is mentioned here is born out of a, a realisation of the magnitude of God's compassion, tenderness and love. Just capture that phrase at the end of verse 4 of chapter 19 for a moment. And brought you to myself. God welcomes his people to himself. He pursues them to be in his presence so that they can enjoy him and that he might enjoy them, his children, his creation. His people are welcomed to the one who will provide and protect. They can trust him to do this because of his track record. And this is our story as well. By faith, we are descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky who are brought to God himself through Jesus with the Holy Spirit as the seal of this covenant. Because of God's great love for us, we have been carried out of death and slavery through Jesus, who through his his death on the cross descended into our Egypt and carried us on eagles' wings. He rescued us. And if the people of Israel will keep God's commands, then they will be his his treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And treasured possessions are, are safely guarded, protected, kept close to those that own the, the person that owns them. A kingdom of priests, it says as well. And the role of The priest is as a mediator. Those who carry God's rescue to the people. Here God is saying that the whole nation will become priests who will carry God's rescue story to other nations 
and people. And this idea of a kingdom of priests is what Jesus came to instigate as he came amongst us, his people as well. To rescue and release a people who would carry the good news of Jesus' rescue to all the peoples and nations of the world. And we are uh, enabled to do this because we can be confident in who God is because of his track record. As we draw closer to him, we become more confident in his trustworthiness. And that enables us to be released, to be his priests and holy nation. But I guess that begs the question, how do people stay close to him? We know that we are, as people, fallen and and wayward, a people prone to wander and, and moan, those who struggle to stick to a narrow path. Israel has already demonstrated this trait of, uh, of wandering and moaning while God led his people through the wilderness. So God gives his people a way of drawing close and staying close to him, the Ten Commandments. Now we see these as rules that are forced on us to constrict us from being who we want to be and doing what we want to do. But they are better understood as an ancient well-being course given to the people to enable them to stay close to God and become the kingdom of priests and holy nation that he wants them to be. Remember that this people, these people of Israel, had been enslaved for 430 years in Egypt. Not only had they been physically enslaved, but they had experienced emotional, cultural and spiritual damage at the hands of the Egyptians. And they were in need of some serious restoration work. And the freedom and restoration that they needed wasn't just the physical freedom that they were now experiencing, but they needed freeing and restoring from the thought processes and worship that had become so ingrained and entrenched within them. They needed setting free from the idols which they'd been forced to build and learn about. They needed setting free from the idea that work was an enslavement which they had to endure, but was actually instead meant to be a gift from God. They needed setting free from the Egyptian patterns of work that gave them no time for worship of God, no time for rest and recuperation. They needed a freedom that allowed them to know what was actually right and wrong. They needed a freedom that enabled them to see life as being full of dignity and value and worth protecting. They needed a freedom that allowed them to see ownership of things as a gift to be stewarded for themselves and for future generations as well. These commandments are the tools for the reconstruction of freedom and well-being in the lives of the Egyptians. I wonder if we're sitting there listening to this and thinking of the echoes in our own lives and time. Our current crisis has caused a lot of us to recognise the the idols that exist in our own lives and society. Idols that damage our view of ourselves and others and cause us to devalue and dehumanise others. We've seen this just in the past few weeks as new laws have been pushed through both our own Parliament and the Northern Ireland Assembly that give worship to the idols of choice and self-determination. 
May we weep with deep sadness and cry out to God, the God who is the giver of life. The current crisis has caused also many of us to recognise how we so easily don't give our attention to our families and those who are closest to us. That we are often so intent on building our own windowless and doorless castles that we forget to give attention to the relationships and friendships that God has gifted us with to steward and to shape us as well. And as we start to get to grips with the health crisis that we've been experiencing, we have started to realise that ahead of us is a crisis in our economy and in employment, where the gift and dignity of worthy work will be stripped away from so many people. I believe that the church must become in this coming generation a a creator of employment and jobs that gives dignity to people and where people realise that their work is a gift from God, that is to the glory of God and the building of his kingdom here on the earth. This is what it means for us today, to be a kingdom of priests for our God. It means for us to recognise that God has rescued us and brought us into his presence. That he has given us a framework for living freely in his presence. He has given us the Holy Spirit to be our strength, our, uh, sorry. This is what it means for us today to be a kingdom of priests for our God. It means for us to recognise that God has rescued us and brought us into his presence through Jesus Christ. He has given us a framework for living freely within his presence, the Ten Commandments. And that great commandment of Jesus as well, to love God and to love our neighbour. He's given us the Holy Spirit to be our strength, our wisdom and our guide as he leads us home, just as God would lead the people of Israel to their home as well. And now he desires that we use that freedom to work with him to build his kingdom, a new kind of kingdom here on the earth, to which one day the Lord Jesus will return to reign for all eternity. We can trust him to do that. What hope we have for today and for all eternity. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you that you have rescued us. You've brought us into your presence. And you've given us a way of living in your presence as well. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are coming again to lead us home. And as we wait for that, Lord God, Would you help us to be about your work, about about building your kingdom here on the earth? Amen.